Ross, I'm so glad to have you with us today on this call for our audience to know a little bit about you. I'd like to introduce Ross Libby. Um, his company's name is Your Bottom Line, and uh, I've known Ross probably going on 10 years now. I first met him at the OSEB, the Ontario Self-Employment Benefit Program. Um, you were this very friendly, warm person who just knew so much about finance and also made it interesting to listen to. So welcome. No, oh, thank you. I appreciate that. For those who can see our screen, um, Ross is a entrepreneur himself and runs this practice, the CFO, CEO, and accounting practice. Is that correct, Ross? That's correct. Have done since 2004. Wow. It's so weird. How many years? 15. Congratulations. And do you think you've mastered it? Oh, gosh. There's always new stuff happening every day. So uh, we, we, if you're not learning something new, you're falling backwards as far as I'm concerned. So. Very, very true. I just want to read your bio to him. Your bio, I just want to read your bio to everybody. He's a former controller and a vice president of finance and administration and has headed up his own training and consulting businesses for a number of years. And when he isn't working at your bottom line, you'll likely find him on stage acting in a theatrical production. Ross and his wife Sue have three boys and call Curtis their home. So the bottom line is that your bottom line is a professional accounting firm. They offer personal and corporate taxes, bookkeeping services, payroll, virtual CFO services, setting up your QuickBooks and learning how to use it. They will do your HST filing and any other remittances that you may need. I know that they work with businesses in the Durham region, but also outside of the Durham region. And we're happy to have you as a member of our expert network to be able to refer clients to you. Oh, happy to be able to help. I know over the years you have certainly helped quite a lot of our clients. Tell me a little bit about your practice. Um, I know that there's yourself, but uh, what are your other associates that work with you? Well, uh, when, we, when we started back in 2004, it was literally just me sitting behind the desk and a computer. Yes. Uh, as, as the business grew and expanded, we did a lot of networking around Durham region and beyond, uh, pulled together the, the beginning formulations of the team uh, brought a bookkeeper and, a, and an accountant and a project manager to the team. Uh, hired, uh, hired my first full-time person in 2010. That was a big step for me. Yes. Uh, as it is for any small business owner, you know, making, making that leap and that commitment up until that point in time, it had all been part-time and temporary, and, and it was a, it was a, a big step. You know, I always tell people that as, as the owners of your own small business, you're going to run into a whole lot of different caps along the way. And the first one is your own hours in a day. There's only so much you can get done. So the question is, do you want to create a, a, a essentially a 40 to 60 hour a week job or do you want to create a business? Right. Uh, so we, uh, we grew and we expanded um, in, in, when, when I started, it operated out of a converted home office, um, which I was sure was going to be just three, four years. Thirteen years later, we, we finally moved out into an office, the space you see here now. Right. Um, this is the, the boardroom and training room that we use. Um, and we now have a team of 14 people. And in fact, we're, we're preparing to move into even bigger space. Very, very uh, cool. Elsewhere in Oshawa. So it's, uh, it's grown. You know, we now have uh, a team of bookkeepers. We have uh, four senior accountants on board. Uh, we have a couple of office administrators who handle a variety of different, uh, different things. So we've got all kinds of different stuff going on to, so that we can narrow in on the specifics of what somebody needs fairly quickly and easily, whether it's corporate or personal taxes, whether it's the bookkeeping, somebody to focus on the payroll, or any of the different components of what somebody may have to deal with. Right, very cool. So tell me a little bit about what, how did you, what made you decide to grow to this size? Well, when we, when we started, uh, it had always been my plan to to grow the business and and expand. Yeah, uh, I, I will say that 
I, I, wa I wasn't exactly sure what that meant when I, when I started. Yeah. Um, and and uh, as, as it grew, I found, you know, somebody said to me in the very early days of my business that there's uh, three different kinds of people in this business. I've since learned it applies to many, many businesses. But there's the finders, the minders, and the grinders. Okay. I mean, ask yourself the question, where do I find my greatest joys? And in the early days, back in 2004, 2005, it was a very difficult question for me to answer because even to this day, I still get excited about the basics of, of balancing a, a, a bank reconciliation, of making different things work, you know, that kind of thing. Um, some people look at me like I have three heads <laughs> um, when, when I say things like that. But the, the challenge is that, you know, as, as you go on, you also look at, well, okay, there's the customer service side of that. There's the, that's the, the management side. And I'm a people person, uh, which is unusual. Yes, for an accountant, absolutely. And that's exactly. what, I, what I loved about you. Yeah. And, and so there's, there's a variety of different things that sort of come to bear and come to play. And then the finder side of this is all about, you know, developing business. And I, as you know, I do a lot of networking. My whole team does a lot of networking around Durham region. And I enjoy that element of it as well. So right. while initially it was uh, a delicate balance of all of those, over time I've sort of moved gradually toward uh, towards more of the finding and minding elements of the business and away from the grinding exactly although i'm the i'm the qc on everything that goes through here i review every tax return and every corporate return and so i try not to be the bottleneck right right so that's very true um, yeah. how did you know that your services would be needed how did you know that there was this growth potential well when we when, when I set this up back in 2004, I looked around at the lay of the land and I realized very quickly that there were a lot of people that I was running into who knew their businesses, you know, upside down and sideways from an operational standpoint or from a marketing standpoint, you know, all of those different elements and components to it. But what they didn't know much about was about the corporate taxes, uh, the integration with between the corporate, the personal taxes, a set of financial statements, how to make all of these things all come together. And quite frankly, for a lot of those people also, even if they were inclined to, to it wasn't necessarily the best and highest utilization of their time. Fair enough. So, so it became very much about how can, how can we assist other people, other companies, in terms of utilizing their times in the best ways possible and taking the, the things off their plate that are just pulling them back, holding them back. Right, right. So do you get to do a lot of work with helping people get set up on, do you, is it just QuickBooks you're using or are there other software platforms you'll use as well? It's predominantly, I would, I would say by far and away, the vast majority of our clientele are on QuickBooks, either desktop or online. And in today's world, probably 80% uh, the QuickBooks online world. Um, we do work, we do have some people who work with other software and we can, ac we can accommodate that as necessary. Uh, yeah. It depends on the individual and their, and their situations. Uh, for QuickBooks, we're very in intricately familiar with that. We do a lot of QuickBooks setups for, for people, a lot of trainings with almost every client who's on board in QuickBooks. Not because people can't pick it up on their own you certainly can there's videos and youtubes and all that sort of stuff up the wazoo um, however we tend to narrow down the focus very quickly into the key things the 80 or 90 percent of things that you're going to see each and every single day and making sure that you're comfortable with those things and we're the support mechanism when you need the support and what i love about that as well is that you're going to understand enough about their business to look at transactions and systems that they need for that and not just general. Exactly, exactly. Necessarily. I have another question for you. I know that you are a networking guru. What are your favorite networking tips that you could impart to our audience? Gosh, great question. Um, 
one of the networks that uh, that I'm a part of uh, operates on the principle of giver's gain. And yeah. when I when I first ran across that, that just intuitively rang a bell for me because I've always sort of, you know, in, in my view, it was just sort of an extension of the golden rule. And, yes. and that's, that's how I've always sort of practiced anyway. You know, how can I help you? What can I do for you? Um, and I've sort of tried to take that and expand that a, a little bit. And I find if you look toward how can I contribute, um, you know, what was it Zig Ziglar said, you know, you help enough, enough other people get what they want and you'll ultimately get what you're, what you're looking for. Um, Very good I point. found that, that definitely reaps a lot of dividends for us. Yes. Um, Bob Bird wrote that book, right? That's, now that you mentioned it, yes, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, I've heard it in a few different contexts, I guess. Yes. Um, another one of my favorite books I ever wrote is actually the founder, uh, sorry, ever wrote, I ever read was the founder of BNI, Business Networking International. And yep. Ross, you have been, how many years have you been a member of that? Um, well, I started uh, YBL back in, uh, your bottom line, back in 2004, and I ran across BNI in 2006. Okay. And, uh, so I've been a member of BNI for 13 years, and we now have, I mentioned earlier that we have uh, a team of 14. Four other of my, uh, my team are also members at other BNI uh, chapters as well. Very cool. Um, and BNI, I mean, I've been to quite a number of them. What I love about BNI is that if you're brand new to networking, it's mm -hmm. such a great education and in experiential learning opportunity for people to learn to network and to sell. So always, you can always go as a guest. I know once or twice a year they allow, you know, the public, if the, you know, businesses who want to come in and go. So if anybody is interested, I'll put some notes in the, in our uh, show notes so that they can connect with you and find out a little bit more about it, if that's all right. By all means, I'd be happy to help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I love, I love it. Um, anyway, one of my favorite books from Dr. Ivan Meisner was The 52% Solution. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Which talks, it's actually all about referral business, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when we think about businesses today, if you think about yourself, tell me where does all your business come from? I, by far and away, had you asked me that question about three or four years ago, yes. I, would have, I would have said very simply referrals. Referrals generate have generated historically about ninety percent plus of our business, um, and the only reason I hedge my bets on that answer now is not that referrals have slowed down in any way, shape, or form. And in, in, in fact, they have picked up. But I also find, in addition to that, uh, between. Uh, Google and social media, which in their own ways are extensions of the whole referral marketplace anyway. Um, we do get a lot from there and from our website as well. So That's technology right. has, has certainly contributed to, to that. If you consider that to be an extension of referrals, then the answer remains the same. But if you consider <laughs> that a separate component, then it, it begins to balance out a little bit over time. Oh, I agree with you. It is, absolutely. Word of mouth marketing is the best marketing that you can ever employ, right? Absolutely. And it helps if Google likes you too. Yes, it does. It does. Do you think there's a, a pattern or a formula to becoming a successful entrepreneur? Like you work with a lot of entrepreneurs and businesses. What do you see about what makes them successful or not? Wow. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of characteristics that I see in, in those people who I would consider to be the most successful. Um, you know, typically these are people who are passionate, they're driven, um, they're highly motivated. Um, they're, they're either, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, they may not necessarily know everything, but they know where to go to get it. They know how to surround themselves with the right people if it's not just about their own skill set and yes. hours of the day, right? Yes. And uh, certainly I would say not being afraid to reach out for help in those areas that aren't your forte. Yes. Plus two. Yeah. So somebody who kind of checks their ego at the door... <laughs> and, and is not afraid to ask for help, look for help, grow their soft skills. Because the things you mentioned there, a lot of that is the soft skills ability. 
Absolutely, Ab absolutely, in, indeed. You know, the um, it, it everybody in their respective businesses, whether you're a consultant, whether you're in social media, whether you're a a plumber or another tradesman. You know, we all have our areas of expertise, but then there's so much more that comes to bear in in making your business a success. Right. Um, the, the marketing is a big plus, you know, one of the reasons, you know, you and I, you mentioned about our, uh, our having connected up. I'm thinking it's well more than 10 years now that I think about it. Yes. It was probably 2005. I'm, yes. I'm I remember. Uh, the, uh, you know, one of the things that sort of drew me to, to BACD back in the day was again, the, you know, the ability to pick up some of those other things that may not have been in my wheelhouse back in the day. Right. And right. knowing that there was a resource to turn to. Yeah. And so true. I think, you know, one of the best things you can ever do for yourself as a business owner is hire out the things you don't know how to do and then learn continually and have an open mind about all the things so that even though you might not know step one, two, three, and four, but that you're aware of what's the overall plan around step one, two, three, and four. Absolutely, absolutely. Sell what you're good at, buy what you're not, right? Very, very true. What's one of the strangest or funniest incidences you've ever experienced in your business? And I know that one's probably gonna make you <laughs> take a pause. <laughs> uh, strangest or funniest. Um, I, I was telling somebody recently a story about, uh, they, they asked me what was the largest number of catch-up tax returns we ever had to do for anybody at one time. What's that, catch-up? Uh, well, oh, catch people up. Who, had, who hadn't filed their tax returns in many, many years. Wow. And it's, it's do that? not... Well, it's not uncommon to find people who come and say, okay, you know, here, I've got three or four years that haven't been done. And, and up until about four years ago, the record that I had was 11 years. Wow. Now we have a new record. Uh, about two years ago, somebody came in with not having filed their tax returns in 22 years. And what was their reason for not doing it? It was rather ironic and a, a bit of a sad story, but uh, they had had a bit of a tussle with CRA and with their accountant in the same year. And they basically threw their hands up and said, I'm not going to play this game anymore. And they just stopped filing. Now, the unfortunate part is this, is that if you, if, if there were certain things in, uh, in tax refunds and so on, that will stale date after three years, some after six years, and some after 10, but everything effectively stale dates after 10 years. This guy was in a relatively simple situation, and most people in relatively simple situations will have refunds, and he thought he had, he was amassing a large savings plan that CRA was holding for him. Everything, all his refunds over 10 years were stale dated, and he has no claim to them anymore. Now, he did get the refunds of the last 10 years, but the other 12 were all gone. And were the refunds substantial enough to have a good nest egg? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, too bad. Yeah. Well, fortunately, there was still some to be garnered from the last 10 years, and we did get almost all of it. Wow. Uh, and, and the rest of it, we just waved goodbye to. Wow. So that's very nice of you to bring him up to date. I mean, has he kept records for 10 years to be able to do this? Actually, we were able to retrieve a lot of it directly from either him or from CRA directly. So with a lot of clients who come in with some catch up on a personal basis, it's fairly easy now for us with all the connectivity that we have with CRA and the different, uh, the different elements of CRA. Right. We, can, we can get most of that information directly from them. Um, what, do you, what advice do you give to someone who they're like, the CRA is calling, uh, we need to go through your business. What, what, what should they do first? Call you? Absolutely. The first thing they should do is talk to an accountant. If you don't have one, now's the time to get one. Get one. Um, you know, the first thing, it's a little bit, and I don't want to overstate it, but you know, we've all watched enough law and order to know you shouldn't sit across the desk from the police without having your lawyer in the room. Works the same with an accountant at CRA. You know, we speak their language. Fair and, uh, I, again, that sounds a little overly dramatic, but uh, I think you get my point. <laughs> I do. 
Um, one of the interesting things I saw that came across social media a couple of months ago is like all the ways that CRA is keeping tabs on you. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw that article, but I saw things like they can see your posts, they can see what you sell on Kijiji, yeah. they can see what you sell on Facebook, on Etsy, on eBay. They know if you're posting a picture of this lovely boat you bought, but then you have no income. Is this true? Well, yeah, I, I, you know, I didn't see that article in particular, but it is absolutely true. I'd love for you to send me over a copy. I will. <laughs> It's, it's absolutely true. You, you, you never know where big, big Brother may be looking over your shoulder. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that all comes together in all of these different components. Whether you're talking personally or corporately, um, there's a lot of interactivity that happens. Yeah. In here. I wouldn't take any of that for granted. Right. So I thought we could just spend a few minutes. Maybe you could tell people a little bit about, like if they were looking to hire an employee or a contractor, just a couple of tips and things like that. I mean, I, I know that you've, when you've done that here at BACD, you've often talked about the business expenses and um, I'd love you just to spend a few minutes talking on that. Okay. Um, when we're, when we're talking about the, uh, the hiring and utilization of, of what I'm going to call external services and so on. A lot of times we get into questions with people about, is this an employment relationship or is this a subcontract relationship? And there's a variety of different things that, that will go into looking at this. One of the first that CRA tends to look at is the issue of control. Who's in control of the relationship? If you're dictating, okay, your hours are gonna be from nine to five and you're gonna sit here at my computer and you're going to do this work and I'm providing all the tools and, and so on and so forth, um, and I give you the work to do and you do the work that I assign to you, you can tell by the language that I'm using here that these are all me being in control of the relationship, so if I were hiring you, that is a higher and employment relationship. Right. On the other hand, if I have a plethora of work to be done and I lay it out here and I say, what would you like to do? Tell me the stuff you want and I'll assign that to you. You can do that here or at home. You could do it on your laptop or you could use mine. You could be, you know, you can use your own tools. Uh, again, you know, you're, you're hearing in the language that I'm using that the definition of that is you being in control of the work that you're doing. Now, I don't want to oversimplify it, and every situation is situationally dependent, you know, upon the particulars of that situation. It, it, it is one area that, that CRA is, you know, definitely, you know, keeping an eye on and making sure that people are doing the right things, doing them the right way, interpreting things the right way. Right, right. Once, once you've once you've determined that somebody's an employee, then of course there are other ramifications that go along with that that don't go along with the subcontract kind of relationship. And so of course they're concerned about CPP and EI and, and income tax withholdings and all of those sort of things, making sure you're doing those right, filing T4s, filing ROEs. And then you're gonna think about, depending upon my industry, is WSIB something I need to think about? And the list goes on. <laughs> right, right. And I mean, I, I as now you're for yourself, even you're at 14 people. Are they all 14 staff members? And, you know, after five employees, you've got to have a joint health and safety committee and you've got to have the green book hanging up. And of course, the Employment Standards Act and an evacuation health policy, you know, uh, all of these different things come to come to bear. They're all they're all part of the, the lay of the land. We do have a blend here of uh, people who work on, on uh, as subcontracted members of the team and those who are here nine to five full time. So right. it, uh, it, de it depends on the needs. We also have people who work remotely as well. Right, which makes sense because you, you listen to what the needs of your customers are and, and what your business demands, right? Exactly, right. and, and the, the accounting, in, in the accounting world, there's a lot of what we do that can be remote that does not need to be part of that puzzle. Right. That we don't necessarily need to be on site, you know, to do the work for our clients. Right. So what parting tips would you give for people that are just starting out in their business and 
not having like not having really thought about what they're going to do around finances and their accounting and their bookkeeping and all that sort of stuff. Yep. Yep. Um, the first thing I, I would suggest is know your strengths and your weaknesses and hire to fill into the gaps. Um, if you know, th there are, we work with clients at, at opposite ends of a very, very long spectrum. There are those who come in who say, look, I can do all this stuff. I just want you to show me how to do it and how to do it the best, fastest, and easiest way. Right. That, that individual, we're going to do a whole lot of training and set up, make sure it's nice, neat, tidy, and simple. And then they can handle it. And then all we need to do is sort of back clean up at the back end. Right. Another client will come in and say, look, I want nothing to do with that stuff. My strengths are not in these administrative areas. Let me go handle the operations and the marketing of my business. And let me hand that off to you. And making that distinction is rather key for people. Now, obviously, each of those different decisions come with different costs associated and so the initial likelihood for a lot of people is I have a lot of time and I have a lot of energy, but I don't have a lot of clients. And I don't have a lot of money. And so they want to do more and more themselves initially. Over time, that, that fulcrum sort of balances back the other way. And they say, well, okay, now I'm, I'm busier than stink and I can't get everything done. So now I, you know, I'm doing the bookkeeping and it's taking me 10 hours to do, but if I gave that to a professional bookkeeper or accountant, it would take them two to four. Right. right? And so you end up, you know, depends on where you are, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, certainly hiring to your weaknesses is a key plus, regardless of what that is. For some people, you know, I designed my first website. I, I shudder to think about it today. <laughs> it was the ugliest thing I ever saw. Um, but you know, now I've got that, I've got somebody else professionally managing that because that is not my forte, you know? Well, and, yes. An accountant putting together a website. I don't know. That, oh, that yeah. not be it, was, <laughs> it, it, it was a glorified online brochure, but again, 2004 was a different time. <laughs> it was, and it didn't matter back then. And also back then websites, a good website would have been ten, fifteen thousand $15,000, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely right. Yep. Today, you can turn that around perhaps for like $2,000. And if you know someone who knows someone, maybe you get it for 700 bucks. It's a totally different marketplace. That's totally absolutely for game. sure. Yeah. One more thing, which I love about, and I, I know a lot of this because we've worked with you in the past, is that QuickBooks today has changed so much. There's so many tools that you can connect to it that they don't even have to see you because you can do everything in the background. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know and, some of those tools that you can connect that you could tell people about? Well, and, and uh, w one of the reasons we have a lot of clients that have gravitated toward things like QuickBooks Online is the fact that you can set it up. If you set it up properly the right way and you do things on an ongoing basis, you can have, have the bank and your credit card feeding information directly in. Now, that means let's say generously maybe half of the data entry is already done now it still doesn't know that check number 123 you know who it was written to but it knows it was written on this date it knows it came through the bank on that date and it was for 565 dollars okay right. well, now all i need to do is fill in the information or if your credit card shows that you went to best buy and picked up something that cost you know, a thousand bucks plus HST, it can separate that information. It will make the assumption uh, that whatever you bought at this supplier was the same as it was last time. That's not always true. And so you want to be careful about just randomly accepting that stuff. But now you can match the information that you've got with the information the bank has. And a lot of your work, you know, a lot of the mundane parts of it can be removed or sped up. Very true. Um, one of the other softwares I heard, or one of the integrations, I mean, I don't know if there's extra cost, but you can take a photo of your receipts and it uploads it into. Ab absolutely correct. Uh, some people will take photos and put them into QuickBooks itself. And that's just all within, within part of QuickBooks. Others will use an app. Uh, there's one called HubDoc, another one called Receipt Bank. Receipt Bank we, we use with a lot of our clients. Literally, take your picture of, of the receipt and 
80 to 95 percent, if not 100 percent, of the accounting will be done on that for you automatically. All you need to do is verify it. And, Amazing. And you email it effectively to your receipt bank email, and then we do the rest. That's amazing. What about, are there any mileage apps that you can connect to QuickBooks as well? There's, a, there's different versions of QuickBooks as well. There's uh, QuickBooks self-employed. Now we don't utilize that for a lot of our clients, but some, no. will, some will utilize that um, strictly for the mileage component of it. Oh, cool, I didn't even know that. There, there's, there's another, uh, a, a number of different apps out there. One, uh, one that I'm familiar with, uh, is Mile IQ, okay. uh, and, and there are if, if you search out mileage apps, there's easily half a dozen that will float to the top fairly quickly. Okay, those are good ideas. Uh, another question, just before I we finish up, is um, when should someone decide to register for HST or not? <laughs> Interesting question, and uh, again, situationally dependent. But let me give you some of the, the short story of the answer. A lot of accountants will advise if you're not going to be doing 30,000 or you're not already doing 30,000, you don't need to worry about registering yet. While that's true, it's oftentimes, in my view, short sighted. Because if you think about how HST filing works, at its very simplest, it asks three questions. The first is how much were your sales? Let's assume $20,000. How much HST did you collect? Well, if you were registered, you would have collected 13% of that or $2,600. Right. The third question is, what are your ITCs? Or put another way, what's the amount of HST that you paid on your business inputs, on the things that you bought, whether it was pens and papers and computers or desks, whatever. Software. Uh, so exactly. So let's assume that this hypothetical individual spent a thousand dollars on HST on the things they bought. So they owe Revenue Canada twenty six hundred dollars for the GST HST that they have collected in trust on behalf of CRA. And Revenue Canada says, "Okay, we'll give you back the thousand dollars that you have already paid. So just give us the sixteen hundred dollars difference." So right. the question I would ask somebody right from day one is, would you like that $1,000 back or not? For most people, the answer is a clear yes. A lot of people won't register initially because they just don't want to invite the added reporting and paperwork into their lives, to which my answer is typically, it's usually to your benefit. Right. Now, any, if your clients are other businesses that are filing the same things, HST is irrelevant. That's a cash flow issue, but you're going to get it back from the government the same way I just described. But if your customers are end consumers, let's say for the sake of argument, a registered massage therapist who's doing $20,000. Now that individual may decide not to register for HST because they're going to be underneath the $30,000 threshold but they don't want to have to charge their clients the added 13%, right? If they know they're going to crest the 30,000 threshold, I'd say you might as well register now anyway. Yes, because you Otherwise, don't have to change your business practice. Your prices. Right? Yeah, right, good point. So it sounds like it's good business to register because why wouldn't you want that money back? Exactly. No, right. I'd rather see it in your hands than in Revenue Canada's. Now it's based on a calendar year, right? If you're a sole proprietorship. If you're a sole proprietor, yes, it is. If you're a corporate, uh, it can be, it depends on how it's set up, but it's usually tied to your fiscal year, although it can also be off cycle as well. Right. Because sometimes some of our clients are like, they're going to be small. They know they're not going to make 30000 in their first year. They're not mm -hmm. going to spend a lot of money. Sometimes yeah. they say, I'm not going to do it. But, you know, any well, money you spend towards your business, you're just losing out on that 13%. If, if your expenditures, if you're in a service-driven business and you don't have a lot of expenditures, it might be that the amount that you would recover, the, the HST that you pay on the things that you buy is small enough that it's really not worth worrying about. And if you're going to be under 30000 that might be another reason to pass. Right. Um, however, in, if you're in any kind of business where you've got you know, initial stuff you're buying, 
you know, whether it's computers and so, you know, hey, if you buy a $2,000 computer, there's 20, 260 bucks, right? Uh, Adds up quickly. Exactly. It, you know, it doesn't take very long to add up. So, you know, I would assess and with, with a lot of businesses, some of the biggest expenditures you have are at the very beginning. Right. So that's another reason to do it. Um, and I mean, people do stop filing at some point too. Oh, but, absolutely. But it's yep. not that easy to get out of going, okay, I've decided I'm not charging HST anymore. Yep. I and have had clients with that one. Yeah, we've had many clients that we have unregistered or deregistered for HST purposes for a variety of reasons. Either business has tapered off or maybe I'm sort of getting into retirement mode or, okay. you know, it dep depends on the circumstance. Makes sense. One of the other questions I have for you, are you working, there are some, uh, what's the word, eventualities, working with businesses that are online now and that are selling globally, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you're getting businesses like that that are you know, having to watch where their sales are going and it's still tied to their income and that kind of thing. Yeah, it, it, it gets into some interesting uh, anomalies, you know, and where's the business actually happening? Where is it being incurred? Governments, as you can well imagine, are very concerned about making sure they get their piece of the pie. <laughs> so, you know, you, you, you need to be very conscious and cautious as you're working through the lay of that land right but i always look at it um often when i get people and they say well i don't want to pay taxes i'm like but it means you're making money if you're paying taxes I, i've often said you know i would be now this you know i would be perfectly happy maybe a bit of an overstatement but i'd be perfectly happy paying a million dollars in taxes because that means i'm making two to two and a half million dollars in income right so like I said, describing it as perfectly happy may be a bit of an overstatement. <laughs> but that's why Canada is Canada, because it has what it has for yep. people. I mean, I grew up in a country where we had no social services, no grants for entrepreneurs, no programs for schools and things like that. So, you know, to me, um, this is what this money pays for, right? Exactly, you know, and those things don't come without a cost, and you know that's also why we have a graduated tax system, right? If you're right. at the low end, you pay the low rates, and as you move your way up through the scale, the rates get higher. Yes, the haves pass it on to the have-nots, which I think exactly, exactly. Isn't that what I mean? Aren't we this blended system as a country anyway, of a little bit between capitalist and and social? Well, yeah, exactly. You know, we 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 choose this this structure and and and. Uh, we operate the way we do out of choice, right? Yeah. So, it, like I said, none of this stuff comes without a lot of cost. A lot That's of true. Along the way. That's true. But it is a great country to do business in, I would say. And I would certainly agree. Yeah. So, Ross, thank you so much for your time. I, I really enjoyed interviewing you and meeting with you because I wanted people to get a sense of you, your personality. Uh, the knowledge that you have to share with people and that they should reach out to you if they need some help. Absolutely my pleasure. If uh, anybody uh, is looking for some advice or direction, I'd be more than happy to help. Thank you, Ross. I really appreciate your time. My pleasure, Teresa. Take care.